my name is Olene, and we're here with George Strompelopoulos. Well done. How are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm good. Um, your show covers everything from politics, pop culture, the environment, human rights, sports, and more. Uh, my question is, is there a topic you feel you have left out or need to explore further? You know, what we do is, I, I kind of put everything under the same category in a sense that to me, everything we talk about is, aside from sports or whatever, most of the conversations I want to have deal with health or justice. Like everything kind of fits into that. You know, human rights fit into everything. There is entertainment for sure. So I, it's not that I necessarily look to explore one large topic. I look for the nuances, hopefully, within each topic. You know, what's the humanity in sports? What's the humanity in politics? And where is the humanity to be found in this particular film? That's, that's what's really important to us on our show. Okay. Um, you have said that radio is your first love. Yep. What about radio do you like better than being on television? Well, in radio, it really comes down to what you say. And I love that. You know, on television, what you say is important, but people pay attention to other things too. Mm -hmm. Is the lighting right? You know, what's the edit like? How's my shirt? That kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which is all fine and part of the conversation, but uh, there's something really liberating with just being at the unit microphone and you're talking to these people that you can't see. And they can't see you, and it's just this natural conversation with them, you know? So I like the simplicity uh, of radio and the power of a, of a pause is really key. In radio and really managing the way things sound so I just like how beautiful and clean radio can be. Okay. Um, you have a very busy lifestyle and I think you've admitted to being a workaholic. Well I, I have been called a workaholic I just think I'm a work enthusiast you know <laughs> this is just the, like the life that I like you know. Yeah do you sometimes feel you need a more balanced life? I used you know probably I don't I, I probably do I think that I've pushed imbalance as far as I could mm -hmm. and I've enjoyed it but I, um, I sort of reached a place where it's not a balance between work and personal life, because I'm not going for that, right? Uh, I want a balance in the way I approach whatever I approach. So if my Wednesday at 2 in the afternoon is what I need it to be, then that's good. So it's not about, work to me isn't so that I can get to the weekends or get to the evenings, right? I don't want to live my life like that. Mm -hmm. So it's more how do I manage what I have to deal with? professionally, personally, all of that, right? So I'm looking for a balance in my worldview, you know, and a balance in my health and a balance in the way I take care of myself and my mind and all that, but not in the traditional work-life balance because I don't, what else would I do? I don't have a family, right? I don't, like, I don't have kids and I don't have a wife and I don't have any of that stuff. So it's not like I'm, when I'm at work, I'm missing some, mm -hmm. Like, I should be somewhere else. I, I, there's nowhere for me to be. If I'm not at work, I'll just go home, right? Yeah. Or go see a movie. So I just want to see if I can have a more balanced, healthy approach to life all told. Mm -hmm. um, and then that would be some kind of balance. Okay. Um, you've talked about needing highs and lows in your life with great emotional range. Uh, what do you think the importance of living in the moment is? Pretty much kind of covered that. Well, I think living in the moment is the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters. So you don't want to work during the week and then just for the weekend, right? right? But yeah. even in the way I approach my work, right? Like when I approach my work, I used to think back in the day that I was building something. I'm not building anything. There's nothing to build. Yeah. There is no nothing but this right here, right? This moment, this is it. And it's not like I'm all Eckhart Tolle about it, but it's the idea that, what is the point of trying, like I don't have goals. I don't set five-year plans. I'm not that guy, right? I just, can I enjoy this? Mm -hmm. and like this thing I'm gonna do tonight here, I'm looking forward to talking to everybody, that'll be cool. My friend Daniel wrote a song once, and it was called Here Is What Is. And he kept singing the chorus, Here Is What Is, and it just stuck in my head. And it got heavier and heavier in my head. It's like, right, here is what is. And this has to be good enough. Because I don't have spirituality to fall back onto. I don't have a religious belief system. I don't have, um, I don't believe in anything after this life. I don't know what happens after, but, but I don't believe in anything after. So it's, this is it. So this has to be good enough for me. And part of the way to do that is to just focus on the now. It's funny because a couple of my really good friends, we've both been, all three of us have been almost hell-bent in, in forward motion in our careers over the last 20 years. You know, we started as kids and we've just been powering through everything, through sickness, through health, through good times, we just power through. And only in the last year or two, really year, and with three grown men, are we starting to have the conversations, you know, about are you enjoying this? Are you in the moment? 
what's life all about, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We didn't used to have those conversations. And I'm glad we are talking about that now because I think we've realized after, you know, basically being a buckshot for the last 20 years, maybe, maybe that was good for what it needed to be, but our brains have changed, right? Our, our souls, have, well, not our souls, but our emotions have changed. Our chemistry has changed. Our addictions have changed if we had any, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so are we, are we making the most of this? And I, that's what I like. This is it's all about basically learning from the surfers. I think the surfers have figured out life. Surfers work really hard to get to a flat spot, and then they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And then when a wave comes, they try to catch it. And I've never seen a surfer ever try to control a wave. All they try to do is ride through a wave and their own way through. And I think that's the secret to life. Stop trying to control everything. Stop trying to figure things out. There's nothing to figure out, right? There just is. So be a good friend, be a good daughter, be a good husband, be a good son, be a good whatever. Um, you know, if you're, mark, if you're going to leave a mark, make it a positive one and be there for others. That's kind of it, you know? And, yeah. I, and I, we, I think we like that. We like that version of life a little better. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we can all feel that our efforts aren't good enough at times. When do you feel you've done a good enough job, a successful interview, or a good show? Well, that's a good question because there's, there's not really a, 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 an answer to it per se. It's more like a good interview is when the person I'm talking to best represents themselves in the moment, and I best represent myself in the moment. And a connection would be nice. Honesty. Yeah, a, that would be nice, but a connection isn't required. Um, the art to this, I think, is to remove your ego from it entirely. You know, just be a person. Be there for somebody. If you're interviewing somebody and they're not in their hometown, like if they're on a tour, chances are they're really tired. Chances, like, and no matter who you are, no matter how much money you have, no matter what, what your level of fame is, no matter what your job is, Tired is tired. Exhaustion is exhaustion. And if you're on the road, you're probably away from somebody who you'd want to be beside, and they're probably mad at you, right? So you've got, everybody has to deal with this. And so you want to have empathy and just humanity when you talk to them. So if I can do that and represent myself and they can do that, then that's a good, um, that's a good interview. For a show, it's partly that, but it's also, did we have range today? Yeah. Did we hit a lot of notes today? You know, I think that's the sign of, but that's not success to me. That's just like, we kind of got a gift from the universe today that we were able to hit on all points. You know, success is so weird. I don't know, I don't, I don't even know how to describe what it is. I suppose success is you get to do tomorrow what you did today because you love it, right? Mm -hmm. So will they let me do it again tomorrow? Then that's success, I suppose. Loving your job? Yeah, yeah. Um, what's one thing uh, that has been said in one of your interviews that really stuck with you? you remember Bill Nye the Science Guy? Yes. Bill Nye the Science Guy blew my mind. Like, <laughs> blew B Bill Nye and Noel Gallagher from Oasis. So we've interviewed presidents and religious leaders and therapists and we interviewed Bill Nye. <laughs> I interviewed him outside of his home in, in, in LA. And I'd asked him when he became an environmentalist. And he said, you become an environmentalist the moment you become a scientist. He said, because you realize, and this is the part that destroyed me, you realize you can't throw anything away because there is no away. It's just somewhere else in your own you know, ecosystem. You can't throw, there's no away. And when he said that, my head just crushed. I was like, oh, oh my God, there's no, I didn't show that, but inside it was like, oh my God, there's no away, there's no away, this is it. There's no away. Like the, the iron rule of ecology is that everything is connected. So there's no empty mm -hmm. space. So if I do this, I'm moving air particles somewhere. Mm -hmm. You are made up of carbon atoms. We're all carbon-based life forms, right? So you and I are made up of the same thing that trees are made up of, same thing that animals are made up of. We're the dirt, we're all that. That's all physically, biologically ironclad. That was just, and I, it's stuff that you know, but then when you hear it put in that context, I was just like stunned. I'm like, there's no way. Right, this is it. I had a, it was a huge moment, like it was a kind of an epiphany. And the other one was with Noel Gallagher from Oasis. He, I'd interviewed him a bunch of times and he was usually really gracious and funny and all that stuff. But at one point I said to him, you look better, like you look happy. He said, yeah, let me tell you what happened. He goes, I was miserable and I knew that something was wrong in my life. So I got rid of the drugs. But then I realized I was still miserable. So I got rid of the booze. And I realized I was still unhappy. 
So I fired my band, right? Because I thought maybe they were the problem because I was still unhappy. He goes, and then I looked at her and he's talking about his wife. And then he said, and sometimes there are people in your life that no matter how much they love you, they don't really want you to get better, right? And so I needed to leave for my own happiness. And he said, the reason people hate making life-changing decisions is because it changes your effing life. And when he said that, I was just, is that much music? I was in every under staircase. I was like, right, right, that's it. That's it, that's, that's the money shot right there in life. People hate making life-changing decisions because it changes their life. And sometimes you're around people who don't want you to be better and you need to be better. And that was it, man. So like, I was blown away by that. Um, but Bill Nye the science guy, <laughs> craziness. It was so amazing that he said that. There's no way. It still sits in my head, and that was three years ago. But I still think about it. What show was that on? It was on, the, on our TV show, on The Hour, when it's called The Hour, yeah. Um, you've mentioned in your past interviews that you admire your mother. As oh, she, I love my baby, my mom for sure. As she raised you as a single parent. Um, how has she shaped the person you are today? My mother uh, did two things that were really important. Um, she did many things that were important. But because my dad left, right, and when he left, he just he left. He never gave her any money, he just took off. My mom was young, uneducated, had only been in Canada for less than 10 years, had two kids, and had nothing, right? We were in a tough spot. I was seven, it's a key time for a kid to lose his dad. My mother never let me say a bad word about him. She never said a bad word about him, never. Anytime I said something bad, I would get hell for it. My, and she kept saying to me, you are not going to grow up with daddy issues. You will not. Now I'm 39, I actually have no daddy issues. Like, I, I, I don't, I'm not mad at my father for leaving. I don't resent him for leaving. I don't have any of those issues whatsoever because my mom, and I think that's, a, that's the, maybe the single biggest difference in my life was the fact that she raised me to believe that old saying, which is the cavalry ain't coming. You know, you're never alone, but you're on your own. You're never alone, but you're on your own. And that was really instrumental in my development. You know, and also because she she, we were too poor to uh, have a babysitter and she didn't get regular work, so she would have to just do temp work. So she had this really clever idea, and I don't know how she figured it out. She would, in the mornings, she would drop me off, my sister and I off, at a library in the neighborhood we lived at and just said, hang around. And she'd go to work at a temp job. What I didn't know, I found out later, is that she asked the librarians to keep an eye on us mm -hmm. and make sure we were just reading books, right? So we just kept reading books. And then she would come at lunch, her lunch break, pick us up and take us down the street from the library, there was a senior citizen's home. And she made my sister and I go into that senior citizen's home. We're young, man. Like I was eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. And she would make us find an elderly person who had nobody, who was alone. And she said, go talk to him. But more importantly, go listen to him. Just go listen to him, keep him company. He has nobody and your job as a human being is to be there for other people. Go listen to him. So I would sit there and listen to guys who were literally 70 years older than I was tell me stories about the war and tell me stories about their kids who may be dead or not or their wives are dead or not, their lives. And I learned humanity from talking to people who had lived life. And my mom was just trying to keep us busy while she was trying to find work, right? Yeah. But when I think about that, it's, it's almost too much to handle for me. It's, you know, I think guys and their moms would get a little bit emotional about it, but it's such a brave little woman who had no idea what to do, figured it out, mm -hmm. you know? Put them in the company of other people who have figured their way through life. And that, man, was like, that's why I think I do this for a living. That's why I approach the world. That, I, that we have completely different views about the world, right? Religiously. She's super religious, super conservative. We're, we're just opposite people, mm -hmm. right? But it's the same beginnings, which is be there for others, right? And um, yeah, she's just crazy baby. My mom, I don't know how she figured that out. You know what else she used to do? She used to she'd put a poster in the um, back of our front door and she wrote a poem out on it because I was a troubled kid in, yeah. a, in a troubled neighborhood, right? Yeah. And she made me recite the poem every day I left the house. I had to just recite the poem every day I left the house so that when I went out there, if I was going to make a bad decision, at least I knew, right? And what was the poem? The poem was, it was this really crazy poem that was like, I used to hate it too because she'd put her arm around me and make me do this. I'd be a teenager. She's like, read it. You don't get to go until you read it. And the poem was, it said, I have to live with myself, and so I want to be fit for myself to know. I want to sit with the setting sun and not hate myself for the things I have done. I want to be able to stand as the days go by and be able to look the world straight in the eye. And she made me read that every day. 
I'll tell you, there was a moment when I went out there and I was going to get in really bad trouble, and I was with my friends. I was going to do something I shouldn't have done, and that poem was just in my head. <laughs> totally. And I left. I left. She just fluked, man. She figured it out. You know? And I asked her later about it. She's like, I didn't know what I was doing. She said, I had no idea. It's pretty cool, though. So that, that's how she informed what I did, right? Yeah. And my uncle, her brother, was really instr instrumental in introducing me to politics and music. Mm -hmm. So I got really into punk rock. Yeah. Um, because of him, he introduced me to Tom Waits. He introduced me to this concept of pushing yourself beyond what is normal, right? So you did have a father figure. Yeah, oh, my uncle. Oh, yeah, my God. Without my uncle Paul, I'm not the same guy. Mm -hmm. He is like... You know that guy in the neighborhood when all the kids go and play at his house and everybody's cool with it because he's like a good man? Yeah. That's my Uncle Paul. My Uncle Paul's like a good man. He's the man that ever, all those shitty dads should go talk to my Uncle Paul and see this is what you can be like, you know? He's not even a dad. He's not even married. He's just my, he's just, he's my boy, right? He just, but I, like, I'm into the arts and culture that I'm into because of my Uncle Paul. He would take, like, I'd be 12 years old. My sister would be nine. And we'd be at the house, my grandmother's house where they lived on the weekends. And he'd say, you want to go see a movie? We'd be like, yeah. He wouldn't take us to, like he sometimes would take us to see Back to the Future, but he would take us mostly to an art house to watch some crazy Russian, um, you know, punk rock movie. I'm 12 years old, a nine year old sister watching this punk rock movie that was really intense, right? Yeah. He, would, he never talked to us like kids. He treated us like adults. Really, really like, really important stuff. He took stuff. you seriously, which. Took me seriously. Yeah. And, and showed me this that, that there is no such thing as a self made person. Anybody who is successful as a human being um, was there by the grace of others, you know? And most people who really struggle through life, they often struggle and it's not their fault. And we have a society constructed that likes to lay blame and likes to figure out why are you like this, right? It's, there's not answers to every question, right? That most of us who've been able to, whatever it means to be well-adjusted, I'm relatively well-adjusted now, but it's the luck and the grace of others, right? That, that, that I'm, my friends and I are like this, you know? And my mom's incredible ingenuity. Your mom's gonna love this. She question. won't watch it, she doesn't even have the internet. My mom doesn't have the internet. Well, she has no cell phone, she doesn't have text message, nothing. I get text message from a kid my mom babysits, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, and she's like a little girl, and I'll get this really intense prayer <laughs> texted to me. I'm like, why is Lainey texting? Oh, my mom's with her, that's why. <laughs> Okay, well, um, Mind Your Mind is a mental health program that helps young people so reach, out, reach out for help during tough times. Uh, one in four Canadians will experience mental health problems in their lifetime, so it's an issue that affects all of us directly or indirectly. Uh, how has mental in illness impacted your personal or professional life? Oh, a lot of my friends, a lot of my friends and some of my family have really struggled with it. You know, and sometimes they get a handle on it and sometimes they didn't. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's better now because of the work, you know, guys like you are doing, you know, stigma is key. Yeah. Understanding is key. I don't understand yet why we can't get policymakers to take mental health issues really seriously. You know, every time you hear somebody go on TV yammering on about homeless people in Toronto, why do you think most people are homeless? A lot of it is mental illness and, and drug addiction, which is a part of it, right? you know, and alcoholism. There, are, there is a lack of empathy from the structures in our system, and they need to get that. And yeah. it's happening with this stuff, what you're doing, because you guys are gonna be the politicians, you guys are gonna be the, the, the CEOs. You know, Bell finally uh, did this great thing. Every year, Bell, there's a Bell Gala, and the money raised went to SickKids Hospital, and recently they shifted it to a CAMH. Um, that's really important. I think that in Toronto, CAMH needs to be celebrated, and, and that's what we should become known for. You know, like the Mayo Clinic and things like that, CAMH needs, there's good and bad there, I, I get there's lots of challenges with mental health, I get it. Um, but that's where we need to, you know, put our attention towards is, you know, and then the practical advice, when I tell my friends or I tell my nephew, honestly, if you're going to smoke weed, don't do it when you're a teenager. Because, you know, certain drugs trigger things, if you're predisposed to certain conditions, certain drugs trigger it early in life, don't do it. I'm not telling you to do or don't do drugs, it's none of my business, but if you do, wait till you're 20. <laughs> you know, like wait till your, your mind's a little more developed. That's like the practical advice I give my nephew. I'm telling like, you're 14, I'm not saying do or don't do drugs, I'm saying don't do them now. If you're gonna smoke weed, wait till you're 19 or 20, man. Like, trust me on this, because I've seen my friends fall apart. And it's not because they smoked weed, it's not because they did drugs. They were predisposed to certain conditions and this helped trigger it. Mm -hmm. And you, 
and sometimes it just comes on. It's like there's an onset, and you have, and what you hope is that you're there for people as much as you can be. You, you, like you can't figure it out. I don't know what to do sometimes with you know people in your life. You, I don't know what to do. Just let them know that they're not alone, yeah. and and be as patient and as empathetic as possible. Try to be as supportive as possible. It is. It's, it's, the, it's the, the most interesting thing about mental illness is that most people don't really understand the toll it takes on a family. They don't understand it. They think, well, that one person in the family is sick and it'll have some ripple effects. It doesn't have ripple effects. It's, it's a clobbering effect on a circle. And we don't have the right support systems because we don't have the right awareness for it. And it, I put most of that on the shoulders of government, that they tackle crime and punishment and all this stuff and they neglect to deal with mental illness as a, as a significant part of it. They don't understand it. Because there's a basic primal part of our, us that feels the need to have justice, like we're owed justice and closure. And we just think that's a catch-all. You know, we don't really understand it. And what we don't understand, a lot of people just pass judgment on. And I think that's a huge mistake. So I know in my life, and I've experienced it, you know, a family member of mine battled with it and died from it. Many of my friends have died from it. Um, the mental illness led to other life choices, which led to you know, trouble and it's just, it's, it ruins you. It ruins, you're never the same, you know, after that. And you can't imagine what your friends are going through. And then they don't even see that you're there for them because that's just not how their chemistry works. It's unbelievable, you know, and I'm sure people watching this know all too well what that's like. Um, and so, I mean, everybody's affected by it for sure, but we still don't have a proper handle on it because we're figuring things out about it all the time. Yeah. And if you, you just got to read back, not even 80 years ago, 40 years ago, 20 years ago in some countries, how people with mental illness are treated. You know, it's inhumane. It's inhumane. It's cruel. And I would like to think that our culture is going to get to a place where there's more understanding and empathy. I don't, I say that with my heart, not my head. Yeah. I'm not an optimistic person in general, but I choose to live optimistically regardless because it's better than the alternative. Um, but yeah, I've seen it destroy families, I've seen it destroy mine, you know, in a big way. So I just hope that, I just love one day for a politician to get out there and say, this is my issue. Yeah. This is my issue. You know, crime and punishment, I don't want to hear that. National security, I don't want to hear that. I assume you're going to take care of crime and punishment national. I assume that. But you need leaders, you need corporate leaders, and you need political leaders, you need media figures, you need people with a microphone to say, this is our issue. This is it. And you know, I interviewed Temple Grandin on the show, Daniel Tam, two people living with autism. Uh, it manifests itself differently in themselves, and it, what they've been able to accomplish is really, it's obviously incredibly inspiring and, and, and interesting. But Temple said something neat to me. She said, the way my brain works, it was a perfect choice for me to help design this system for cattle. She goes, a lot of kids with autism would be amazing in design and in computer games and in, in software development, right? Because we see numbers differently. And that self-aware moment from her was, was like a wall coming down, you know? We need to understand and create a world that's, that doesn't try to isolate everybody, but tries to work with everybody. You know, be like the currents. How do we all work together? And I would just love it if politicians would take that up and go, this is our thing. This is important to us. Who would be against that? You couldn't, like you couldn't get, you couldn't be anything but behind leaders who do that. I've yet yeah. to see a prime minister do it. And they have it in their own families, man. And I've yet yeah. to see prime ministers do it. Like stand there and go, this is it. Health and justice, this is it for everybody. You know, I think it would be super cool. Um, Sorry if I'm going on too long. If that's okay. You have been involved with numerous charities and campaigns such as War Child Canada, Make Poverty History, and Hip Hop for Africa. Uh, what sparked your love and interest in humanitarianism? Well, I, I didn't know it, but music connected me to other people, right? Um, music took me to places I could never otherwise go. Um, and so when I was growing up, I just sort of lost myself in music. The sorts of music I lost myself in, though, were really isolated sounds, you know? So in my neighborhood, listening to punk rock or really heavy metal, there weren't many of us, you know? So you're an outsider with a group of outsiders. But over time, when you listen to the lyrics enough, if the lyrics are about social change and about justice, then you can choose to ignore it or not. I chose to not. 
or I, or I didn't really choose my, however my wiring is, it, I was open to it. So for me it was The Clash, hearing The Clash sing about injustice and racism. Because when you're eight, you don't really know what racism is. You don't really know. I mean, you think you know, but then you see it. Um, and so music got me. I was very lucky that when I had questions about it, my uncle was there to answer it. My mother was there to answer it, you know, and to point me in the right direction. You know, they were never, they never passed judgment on people in tough situations. They always tried to explain why they're in that situation, right? And that's Giving what, the benefit of the doubt for yeah. everyone. Or showing you that there are reasons why people who are yeah. in poverty-stricken situations are in poverty-stricken. There's, you know, the first time you fully understand what socioeconomic <laughs> structure is, it's like, oh yeah, okay. I don't think the system's broken. I think the system's designed to keep rich people rich and poor people poor. That's why, you know, that's, that I don't believe in the American dream. I don't believe in the Canadian dream. It's not real. It's not real. You can't just, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and make whatever you want out of life. You can't do that. That's not real. And the people who do do it, they're the anomalies. It's so rare, you know. It's, but you can be a good person and you can build a good neighborhood. You know, so you have personal responsibility in that respect. Just because the world beats you down doesn't mean you have to just give up, right? So there is personal responsibility for sure, but you, you just come to realize that there's always another side to the story. And often people in tough spots, they want a good life too. People want jobs. You create an economic reality where people don't get jobs. Once you take away the basic foundation of a life, which is a job in our society, yeah. what are you going to do? No jobs. No jobs, no way out, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can't pay for food for your kid, no way out. So we, we, have, we often just focus on the end result. We never really focus on the causes. And music is what helped introduce me to that. And then my uncle, because I really looked up to him, he would read the newspaper, and he would hand me a section, and I'd have to read it. You know, and we would talk about what I read about in the newspaper. You know, and I never watched people my own age on television. Let me give you one. If you're watching TV and you're watching people your own age, if you're young, stop it. Don't watch people your own age on TV. Why watch somebody else's life that you already have? Don't. Watch other people's lives, people that are older than you, people that experience more. Try to find your way through it, you know? Um, and that's what I, I, I was lucky enough to do. Is I, you know, my uncle gave me a book about politics, about the history of Canadian politics when I was 12. I had no idea that it would inform my job 20 years later, but it did. He also gave me the whole Sherlock Holmes series. And they're so well written. I, I got into it and I read every story a couple of times. And that was a place to go. A, it kept me out of trouble, mm -hmm. but I got to imagine, and I got to see England, historically, right? Things that I wouldn't ever get to see, yeah. you know? And that kind of stuff, you know, I think that's why human rights are important because it's all part of the same thing. It's all just be there for other people. And also everybody's, I don't believe that everybody's entitled to an equal outcome, because I believe in personal accountability, yeah. but I believe that everybody's entitled to an equal opportunity. And outcome is up to you after that. But I don't think, everybody, obviously, not everybody gets an equal opportunity. The system is slanted, right? So if everybody had an equal opportunity, then they can all have a chance at an equal outcome. You know? But I don't think they get an equal opportunity. So everyone should have the essentials for life. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, OK, so we'll switch up the interview style. Yeah. We'll make it kind of a, we're, we're calling this the free association with George. So How I'll very Sigmund Freud of you. I will be glad to free associate with you. <laughs> and uh, I'll just ask you something quickly. Yes. And then you just say whatever comes to your mind. Okay, that's, not, that's dangerous. Okay. So best <laughs> arena concert ever. Best arena concert ever. Pink Floyd. Oh, no, you said arena, not stadium. Stadium would be Pink Floyd. Best arena. Oh, yeah, man, 1987, 88, I went and saw Metallica play. Before Metallica had songs on the radio, before they were the band that they are now, they were still really loud and really metal men. And they went on stage at Maple Leaf Gardens and destroyed the place. Destroyed the place. And in that crowd, I was probably 16, I remember seeing skinheads and bikers, white guys, black guys, Asian guys, right? Um, mostly guys, some girls, but different backgrounds, different political points of view, different socioeconomic reality. Everybody gathered to watch this just this crushing skull music, and it wasn't on the radio, right? So you felt like, for the first time ever, I felt like, hey man, we're winning. Our band is winning, like we're winning. You know, this is our music and we're winning. They sold out this arena. It was a life-changing moment for me. Oh, I used to live my life between Metallica albums after that. 
It was so huge. People make fun of Metallica now because they, they only think about the last 15 years of it. They don't realize that yeah. early 80s when Metallica came out, and went because hair metal, you know, even later when all the metal bands were really kind of flashy and makeup-y, Metallica were just brutal. It was raw, honest, like brutal music. And for guys like me, that's what we loved. Oh, it was so rugged. Uh, second one, uh, Back to Black from Amy Winehouse. Yeah. About that song? I, first thing I think about from that song is you went back to her and I went back to black. <laughs> that lyric is incredible. I interviewed her once and she was a complete and utter mess on that red carpet. Um, I don't know how many, I don't know her life. I don't know how many people in her world tried to save her, but she collapsed under it all completely unnecessarily. Yeah, because you know. it, it was definitely not a surprise. No, because everybody in the media picked up on it. They loved it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all those people who watch those entertainment, you know, when Britney Spears shaved her head and kind of lost it a little bit, and everybody that made fun of her. That's on you, yeah. you know. You, the best guy was Craig Ferguson that night when, after she checked into rehab, all the other talk shows were making fun of her. Craig Ferguson went on TV and said, you know what, 10 years ago I was in rehab. It would be really a terrible move if I went and made fun of her tonight. Yeah. Rehab's hard, yeah. you know, and... A lot of people make fun of people who, who, who battle, or they, or they think drug addiction is entirely your fault. Mm -hmm. It's your fault if you become addicted to drugs. But at that point, laying blame is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Trying to get off of an addiction is no longer your fault. That's chemical. Now you just have to deal with that differently, right? Um, and it's, Amy Winehouse is in the same boat. But that record, oh, that record. Maybe one of the last of the great records. Yeah. Uh, much music's the new music. Yes, that's the reason I'm on TV, was that show. Because when I was first contacted to work at Much Music, I wasn't really that interested in it. I didn't watch Much Music, I didn't have cable growing up, so I didn't know much about it. I just knew that they played videos of bands I didn't like. They were just about to hit that boy band era and those pop stars and I didn't want to be a part of it. It's not bad music, it just wasn't for me. <laughs> yeah. But it was the new music. They offered me the new music. And I remember watching that show because that was on City TV in Toronto. Back when it was on Channel 79, before it came Channel 57, and we only had one TV that my mother found in the garbage, and she kept it in her bedroom closet, and we were only allowed to watch TV on Friday nights. We'd watch Knight Rider, Dukes of Hazard, and Dallas if we were good, because she watched her show Dallas. We weren't allowed to watch TV. The only other show I could sneak in and watch uh, in her closet, I would watch the new music. And that's how I learned about the Jesus and Mary chain, and that's how I learned about Rapper's Delight, you know, and the Sugar Hill Gang, and that's where I saw black music on TV. You didn't see music by black artists on TV at that point. Rock stations play white guys, except for Jimi Hendrix and Bob Marley, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you didn't see culture represented in music, but I saw it on the new music. So when they offered me that job, I was absolutely into taking it. Favorite inter interview of all time? Kermit the Frog. I interviewed Kermit <laughs> the Frog. Because Kermit the Frog, because you know what was amazing about Kermit the Frog? The emotional response from everybody who watched it. Because the moment, so you know, where you're sitting, that was where the frog hit, and then the guy who was the frog was down here laying on yeah. the ground. And I stared into the white plastic eyes of the frog. And when he just started talking, and he said my name, right, I was like, oh my God, the first TV host I ever identified with ever was when Kermit hosted The Muppet Show. It's the first host I ever identified with, right? And everybody in the audience was like on the edge of their seat. So, because, you know what, because he was positive. Kermit made you feel like you did when you were a kid. And when you were a kid, everything was gonna be all right. Even when everything backstage in the Muppet Show was falling apart, they always pulled it off, right? And it was, and Kermit, so yeah, when I heard Kermit this year, I was like, yeah, it's impossible to be jaded when you hang around the frog. <laughs> that frog was amazing. Hey, uh, turning 40. Yeah, I know, this summer, right? Oh. Actually, I don't worry about it at all. I like getting old. I don't think I was a good boy. I think I'm gonna be a better man. I think I'm designed to be a man, not a boy. Um, and I'm okay with that. You know, I live my life the way I want to live my life. I ride fast motorcycles into hard turns. Mm -hmm. I travel wherever I feel like it. I buy old cars. I drive old cars. And I, I live my life the way I want to. So I don't feel trapped by anything, right? So turning 40 is cool. Because, I mean, it's like I enjoy it. Yeah? We're on 10 minutes? Okay, cool. How is it out there? Oh, good. Okay, good, cool. Thanks. Okay, I'll cut this short. And uh, what's your New Year's resolution? I don't, th I don't think I have one. I don't really make New Year's resolutions. I, well, no, yeah, I guess at work, 
have sort of issued the benign edict at work, which is, or just trying to get people to do that. I'm tired of being around cynicism. I don't want to be around it anymore. We've had enough. Mm -hmm. I want critique and critical thought. Not everything is positive, but I'm tired of cynicism. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Um, and it's okay to have a little bit behind the scenes, but in the execution of your storytelling of your life, are you going to be cynical or are you not going to be cynical? And I want to be over here. I'm not a cynical guy, but I, I, I mean, I enjoy it. Like I, a lot of the people, you know, you get a bunch of cats together and you can, it's easy to become cynical. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be around it. I just think that life is way too short. And you hit yeah. 40, man. Like I'm already, half, if I live to be 80, that's going to be a miracle, right? That's a miracle to get that old. I'm already half my life. That's crazy to me. How half my life gone, right? So, but the way I wanted to make the most of my life is be, yeah. is just be around positivity. Because otherwise, what's the point? What, what, what is cynicism going to accomplish, really? Yeah. Except give you a reason not to like something. If I hate a movie, I go in there looking to like a movie. Everything I, except for music, because music's different to me. Music, I'm not cynical about music. Music is, you're either authentic or you're not, right? And I can be everybody in your own life. You're the arbiter of it. So, but I go to movies. I want to, I want to like it. And if I don't like it, I find, can I find ways to like it? And then if I can't find ways to like it, then I don't like it. But I really work really hard to like almost everything. Yeah. You know, and I still believe in critical thought and critical views, but there's a difference between that and cynicism. Well, thank you so much no for problem. your cool. Was that all right? Was that okay? You're a busy guy, right? so we're okay? gonna let you go. No, no problem. Oh, yeah. I'm going on soon. All right, thank, thank you, you so much. No problem, thank you.